So I think we'll get going and then, uh, you know, others can uh, join in when they get here. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming out today virtually. And first of all, I'd like to begin by noting that Yale University rests today on the lands and territories of indigenous folks, including Mohegan, Massachusetts and Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Skokitoke, Golden Hill, Pakistan, Niantic, Quinnipiac, and other Algonquin speaking peoples. The history of Yale as an institution is inseparable from broader histories of imperialism and settler colonialism. And I just want to acknowledge that right at the outset. Um, my name is Swagato Chakraborty, and I'm a PhD candidate at Yale in history of art and film and media. And I work on late modern and contemporary art and visual culture broadly. My dissertation is a cross-cultural study of displacement and form in contemporary art, particularly time-based media, uh, with a focus on South Asian and African diasporic culture production. I've also held curatorial positions at um, the Museum of Modern Art, um, the New Museum, and the Jewish Museum in New York. Currently, I serve as a public humanities fellow at Yale in the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. So I'm very grateful to the Public Humanities Program for um, sponsoring this series of conversation that I'm leading over the spring term. Um, thanks to Karen Rothman, Senior Lecturer in the Humanities, English, and American Studies, and the Associate Director of the Public Humanities Program. I am also joined by Matt Jacobson, who is William Robertson Co-Professor in American Studies, African American Studies, and History at Yale. Matt, thank you for being here today, um, for the material support that you've provided, and for your interest in uh, being part of these conversations. Um, when Matt and Karen uh, invited me to organize this series, I saw an opportunity to kind of put together my own research and professional interests in the arts and culture uh, in conversation with the broader remit of what we understand by the public humanities. Um, in particular, coming after the multiple crisis, national, international, that we, that we all navigated throughout 2020, uh, the after effects of which continue to ripple outward. I wanted to bring together a range of folks working in different capacities at cultural organizations, all of whose work is either public facing or takes up matters in the public interest. And my hope is that, uh, you know, beginning today and over the course of the, uh, of the spring, uh, these conversations will generate ways in which we can reconsider the intersections of culture and its varied publics with particular attention to the question of what can our institutions and organizations, universities, museums, other arts and cultural organizations, what can they and what do they need to do uh, to move beyond the rhetoric of diversity, equity, access, inclusivity, in order to actually become more equitable, to actually narrate the histories of American arts, culture, and the humanities. And so I'm delighted and honored today uh, to be in conversation today with Emma Robbins. Robbins is a DNA artist, activist, and community organizer with a passion for empowering indigenous women. As the director of the Navajo Water Project, part of the human rights organization, Dig Deep, she is working to create infrastructure that brings clean running water to the one in three Navajo families without access to this basic rights. In addition to her water work, she is also the founder of Capture House, an indigenous art space. Robbins took her BFA at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago and studied modern Latin American history in Argentina. She is an Aspen Institute Healthy Community Fellow and splits her time between LA and the Navajo Nation. Emma, thank you for being here today and for being a part of this conversation with us. Thank you, Swagato. I'm so honored to be here and thank you for organizing this, Matt. Thank you as well. Um, and to everybody tuning in, I appreciate you taking a Friday afternoon to listen to me ramble about art, water, indigenous issues, but 
Um, I think it's gonna be a real treat having this convo with you, Svavato, so thank you. Um, like you did, I wanna honor that I am on the traditional homelands of the Tongva. I am based here on Tongva land part of the month and usually on the Navajo Nation where I'm from. I'm gonna just introduce myself very quickly in Navajo. Uh, as I mentioned, I am from the Navajo Nation. My dad's family is Navajo. I am Navajo and my mom's family is Jewish. So I come from a very mixed background. Um, just like my cultural and ethnic background, I have a pretty good mix going on in my professional life. And I'm gonna to talk to y'all about that a little bit more, presenting a few slides before we jump in. Awesome. So yeah, if that's cool with you, I'll just start sharing my screen. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Great, so I wanna to talk to you about sort of three things that you mentioned, Swagato, in that very kind intro. Um, we'll be starting out by talking about my arts practice and then talking about the work that I do with the Navajo Water Project, um, touching a little bit on the activism part, but more importantly, the actual work that's done in the project on the Navajo Nation. And then talking about community art spaces and a project that I just started not too long ago, actually about a year and a half ago, called the Chapter House, which you mentioned. Um, so we'll touch a little bit more on these series here, but I am an artist who has a background in photography and switched to doing work that was much more hands-on. So literally manipulating surfaces, embellishing found objects, a lot of my work is a mix of things that are sort of seen as pan indigenous. So quills, hair, um, jingles, some things that might not be specific to one tribe, but throughout um, native nations are used in our arts. And then also I use a lot of things that um, I see as filled with humor. So, you know, things like these postcards here on the left that I forage from different gas stations across the Navajo Nation or places that I might visit, like if I go to Lakota country or other areas. Um, and then materials that are actually traditional to my own tribe, so to the Dene, or that might be from our reservation, like this flower bag here on the right. Um, and I love combining these. And this is actually from a series that I'm gonna talk about that's made about treaties, but I wanna talk about treaties first. <clears throat> so, you know, over the past hundreds of years since the United States was formed, for lack of a better way to say it, um, they have signed hundreds of treaties with many different Native nations across the United States, so-called United States, and not one of these treaties has been honored. Every single treaty has been broken. And I start here not only because I want to talk about the series that I make around treaties, but also because when people ask me about the work that I do, both in the water world and in community organization and in my arts, I always point back to treaties and the importance of these documents. As I mentioned, they haven't been honored, but if we as a country, as the United States, were breaking treaties with international organizations or countries, it'd be a huge deal and there would be an uproar. You know, treaties navigate who Native nations are and what we're allowed to do and how we govern ourselves. Um, and they've played a big role in where our culture has gone. So here I just wanna show you on the left, this is a treaty that was signed with the Navajo Nation, the federal government. And I wanna point out to you that here at the top, you can see that there are actual signatures from government representatives who sign these. And then on the bottom, these are male leaders of the Navajo Nation, uh, which is important to mention because, you know, we're a matriarchal society and women up until this point of signing the treaties had always been our leaders. And um, 
the important part here is that people were not able to sign their names because they generally couldn't read or speak English or even write English. And so they made an X mark to say that they acknowledged it. The treaty here on the right, this is a segment um, from one of the 18 treaties that were lost, quote unquote, lost in California. And I highlighted some of the provisions that were supposed to be provided in exchange for things like land and water and rights. And I mentioned the 18 lost treaties because I'm here in Los Angeles or again on Tongva land. And these affected all of the tribes whose land um, or one specific tribe whose land I'm occupying and who we are in California. Um, these treaties were actually signed just like here on the left, but they were never ratified by the US Senate and they were supposedly lost and they were found in the 1930s locked away in a government desk. And so again, really thinking about the fact that these weren't even put into place and they were promises that were broken. And these could be things like um, needles or cloth that was supposed to be exchanged for land. So treaties are very important to mention because this is what governs who we are. And in these treaties, things like water was promised and water infrastructure. So we'll talk more about that and how this influenced um, the current body of work that I've been making over the past several years. And you saw there that it said something about flannel and needles. And so I mentioned my work is very material heavy. I started making these tablet shaped pieces that were drawing materials from those treaties as well. So this is actually um, 500 needles and that was what was promised for a segment of a river. I mentioned I draw a lot of materials from the reservation, my own specifically. Um, and this is a bag from the Navajo Generating Station, which was one of the last coal firing plants in the United States. And again, using this mark of the X, right? Like how things were signed away just with a simple X um, and how, you know, to this day, we're having issues on the Navajo Nation, like exploitative coal companies coming in and polluting our environment. And one thing that people don't think about with coal companies and coal mining and coal firing plants is that it's not only putting pollution into the air, but it's taking our drinking water and it's contaminating that with um, coal. So the Navajo Generating Station was actually um, felled in last year, two years ago, and it's something that we're still seeing the effects on our land. So um, very interested in what help keep this land beautiful means. I mean, this is something that people put trash in, but what does that actually mean? And how does that relate to we, who we are as people on the reservation? There is a lot of uranium on the Navajo Nation. There are many abandoned mine lands. And this is an issue why not all of us have drinking water. 30% of Navajos living on the reservation do not have access to safe drinking water. So they don't have piped water in their homes and they don't have sanitation, which means they don't have bathrooms. A large percentage of these folks as well don't have electricity, which is a huge issue because generally you need electricity to bring water into your home through a pump and then you need a water heater. So I collect a lot of these pamphlets from um, the Navajo Nation EPA or different tribal government entities that I might be visiting. And this is sort of where I start combining my art with the water work that I do. You know, all of us across the Navajo Nation have either had family members or ourselves have gotten sick. Um, uranium causes kidney failure and stomach cancer, and it causes death which is a huge issue. And so this isn't something that only happens in little pockets across the reservation. It's very prevalent. So jumping from that, I definitely wanna tell you about the Navajo Water Project. The Navajo Water Project was started in 2014 and we were working with a partner in New Mexico called St. Bonaventure Indian Mission. Um, we are not a religious organization, but our partner is, and we had seen that they were doing a water trucking route. So taking water from a safe water source and bringing it to homes who did not have piped water. 
um, we became interested in that. And then I eventually came on in 2016. And at that point we had installed what we call a home water system. And a home water system is a pretty fair, fairly simple setup. It's a underground storage tank. Um, it has a series of plumbing, a pump that brings the water in, a heater, a particle filter, and a sink. And we have done now in my tenure in the past five years, almost 300 of these, branching from this one site in New Mexico to across the reservation. And these are off-grid systems for families who don't, again, have piped water or who won't have the potential to get it or who are on a waiting list that could take decades to get. These tanks here are actually work that we've had to shift to do during COVID. And these are much smaller tanks and they're above ground and they're not indoors. Um, but it's something that's been really vital because obviously during a pandemic, when you don't have running water, it's a huge issue, not only because you can't wash your hands, but because people can't shelter at place safely, at home safely, excuse me. They have to go to different grocery stores or watering points. And if um, you know one watering point is too full or there isn't water because of a drought, people might go to unsafe sources. So we haven't done any home water system installations since March of last year. Obviously, like everybody else, it affected the work that we did because of the pandemic, but we've been able to get um, about 820 homes, these tanks, which has been really vital. And now that things are getting much better in the Navajo Nation, um, we are seeing a much lower rate of infection, which is really great. We are able to start transitioning back into those. Uh, but here's a water truck on the left and we have, we own five of these and our project partners own three. And so they'll truck water to the different systems or in this case during COVID to these 275 gallon tanks. So I wanna show you actually a video of Grandma Emma Seaton, who's in one of the communities we work in, in Navajo Mountain or Natsitsan. And this guy here on the right is Randy. He's a plumber from Green Bay, Wisconsin, and he's a part of an organization called I Wish. And the Navajo Water Project and Dig Deep have teamed up with him and his great crew because they are a group of certified plumbers and electricians and pipe fitters. And the allyship has been amazing. The accomplish, accomplice ship has been great because they're coming and bringing skills that we might not all have and helping us do things like get running water to homes, but more specifically, as is the case here with Emma, who's 94, um, get things like bathroom and septic. So I'm just gonna show you what one of our systems looks like when it's turned on and show you um, Emma getting water for the first time at age 94. Yes. So this is where I'm going to touch a little bit on the activism part. Um, like many people, I got to go to Standing Rock and it was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. And that was something that I was able to do through the Navajo Water Project um, and go and do some volunteer work there and bring some supplies. I was there in the summertime and then I went back um, towards the end of the camp in December. And it was just like really impactful for me. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I'm an artist, but I did not mention that my background is actually in the commercial art world. So prior to working at Dig Deep, I was working as the director of an art gallery in Chicago and totally different worlds, obviously human rights sphere, um, commercial art world. But I will talk a little bit more about that in a second, but it was something where it was like, this was sort of the side of why I was so interested in water was the idea of activism and standing up with fellow indigenous peoples and fighting for our water sources. Um, so, you know, this is actually when I started getting very into learning about treaties and doing my research there and bringing that into my art. 
But again, I think more than anything, it was the idea of community that I was very interested in. So um, water kind of led me back to the idea of community, which is where I started from when I came to dig deep. And then it really pushed me to start thinking about these white cube spaces and institutional art spaces and who's allowed to be where and who's allowed to exhibit their work. So um, sort of jumping back and forth there. So after I was at Standing Rock, I continued to make work obviously. And this show was a really big turning point for me. I was able to show a lot of the treaties. I was able to do a pretty big installation piece, educating people about the missing and murdered indigenous women um, epidemic. And it was something where it was just a really good experience because I got to convert this commercial white cube space into a community center. And we hosted things like a dinner, a Navajo taco dinner. And we had Piccadillys. And for those of you on this call who are from the res, you know what Piccadillys are. For those of you who aren't from the res, Piccadillys are a slushy where you have chopped up pickles that have Kool-Aid in them and Kool-Aid soaked gummy bears. and. I mean, there's a divide. Some people think they're really disgusting or if you're like me, you think they're really good. So bringing this sort of like res specificity into this white cube space and, you know, there were natives and non-natives alike. And it was really interesting to have these conversations about um, why this food even exists. Like why do we eat fry bread? And it again leads back to treaties, right? Like things that might've been promised in it like food rations, like white flour. Um, and, you know, I mean, obviously a Piccadilly is not healthy. So having that conversation around that as well. And also just sort of like the uniqueness of it. And I really loved it. And I wanted to start combining all of these worlds together. So like activism, water, um, the arts, indigenous peoples, allies. And I started to really think about how to do that. Um, I'm just going to show this really briefly because I don't, generally show this, but this is the piece that I mentioned about the missing and murdered indigenous women. And it was a real turning point for me because I felt like this is how I would display this problem in this like fancy gallery in Chicago, but how would I educate our own community about it? And how would I talk about the fact that every year, thousands and thousands and thousands of not only women at this point, but indigenous relatives overall, um, are found, you know, murdered or they're disappeared or they're kidnapped and there's just not enough data out there. So this is sort of one rendition of education around missing and murdered indigenous women. I'm gonna show you um, what it looks like more in a communal space. So this gallery was a pretty large gallery and um, my partner helped me because I don't have the patience to glue individual tiny pieces of hair, but I can do larger portions like this. But the two of us over the course of several days lined um, all of the cracks and the spaces in the gallery with hair. And if you look closely here on the right, you can see some of it in the spaces in the door and the floor um, in the part that's spaced where there is a wall. And this was something where, again, I just really wanted to show people like this is not, this is a hidden problem, but it's present and it's everywhere. And again, as I mentioned, I love working with hair. And I think hair is something that's very taboo in Navajo culture. Um, death is very taboo in Navajo culture to talk about it, but it's something that we have to talk about. And it's something where it's like, I read these articles or when you hear about people reporting um, family that's been found, oftentimes they talk about the hair first. And it can be really jarring. And it's also uh, something that I think a lot of people kind of place that stereotype of, oh, well, all quote unquote Indians have black straight hair. So thinking back again to bringing this more into a public space, education about MMIW, um, and then also wanting to not just display work in a white cube space, um, and not display it only for non-natives who are able to go to those galleries. 
but also to just sort of work with the community to tell the story um, and to stop talking about data as if they are just numbers. I mentioned data, which is very hard to collect on the reservation and all of the work that I do, um, both the arts, but also water. I mean, we just don't have a grasp actually on how many homes there are without running water at any given moment and fluctuates so often. So I was asked by my community of Tuba City on the reservation to um, educate people about this problem and bring awareness. And it was really important to me that we put names and faces to the numbers and to the problem. And so I worked with the community to take portraits of uh, tens of different women and girls and talk to them about their experiences um, and also just showing like these are our moms and our sisters and our aunts and our grandmas and our daughters. And so these people who are going missing, they are important. So this was placed um, throughout the community in Tuba City at the Western Navajo Fair in 2019. And it was, they were all life-size portraits. And again, it was to show like we're present, right? But very different from a white cube space. So the last thing, here's one more portrait of my little niece and my sister. Um, the last thing that I wanna to touch on is the chapter house and talk briefly about that before Swagato and I jump into talking about some of these things and other issues and solutions. Um, so the chapter house is a 501c3. We consider ourselves an indigenous space, but all are welcome because like we saw in the video of getting someone like Emma Seaton running water at age 94 for the first time, allyship and um, having non-native accomplices can be very important when done responsibly, right? And so um, most of us who run this space, I'm the founder, and most of us who run this space are native women. And we have a couple of really amazing non-native people who work on this project. And the idea is to just bring us back together to this space because quite honestly, it shouldn't take something like Standing Rock where we're all traveling to a state or to a reservation or land that isn't ours, but we need to have these centers where people can come together and do things like celebrate art or have those taco dinners or eat piccadillies, whether you think they're gross or not, um, and have discussions about what it's like to be native in the 21st century and talk about our cultures as individual tribes. Um, you know, obviously being Navajo, I'm very different from someone who might be Lakota or someone who might be Cherokee. But then again, having these conversations about how we work together and who we are as a collective. So we have a series of podcasts. It started out as a video cast and actually you can hear us on Apple or uh, Spotify. But there is, um, this is the first given Elder Mike interview that we did. And the idea behind it is that someone interviews an elder from their community. And we talk about modern things that are going on, cultural things, things from their past. And um, my sister, Isabella, did this interview with me. And she actually sits on our board of the chapter house and is extremely helpful and has made this project really successful. Um, I also want to give a shout out to like my main lady who helps me out with the project, Katie Jantz, who I believe is on this call as well. Um, but I couldn't do it without her. And again, you know, Katie is someone who I connected with through the water world, but it jumped back over to the community organization and the arts world. So that happens a lot in the things I do. So I'm going to share just a brief segment of this. This is the way we lived. Um, so uh, it was. I didn't know any better, I guess, but um, so anyway, um, and then, you know, it went to school, you know, we, um, we were required, my parents were required to put us in school, and you know, I went to preschool out here, and I went to the boarding school in Tuba City, uh, or uh, from the, you know, what they, at that time, they used to call it, they didn't call it kindergarten, they used to call it beginner, you know, and I was like, I was six years old when they put me in there, and and I remember going there and getting dropped, get, being dropped off for school. And I remember, you know, in this being in this strange place, you know, um, the building actually, you know, and, and all the kids are crying because, you know, they're, they're missing their moms and their dads. And, and some for the many is probably the first time they um, left, you know, their parents. And it's the same as with me. 
but I don't remember uh, crying or I don't remember, you know, uh, but I remember kind of being a little scared. I remember being um, sad because, you know, I knew my, you know, just dropped off with strangers and things like that. So that was my first experience uh, with being away from home and, and having to be um, sent away to school. So again, like this gets back to the treaties of native peoples being sent to federal government boarding schools. Um, and I'm gonna actually, I'll drop a link afterwards because I really do encourage everyone to not only know whose land you're occupying, but know what the treaties are of those nations. And, you know, that really will show you like this shapes everything. We talked about it from art to community, to education, to water, to other issues with infrastructure. And it's just really important that we understand those issues. So I'm gonna leave you with my info here. Um, please check out the chapter house. We are, you know, we've been around officially as a 501c3 since March of last year. So our idea is to come together as native peoples in a physical location, but obviously with the pandemic, we weren't able to do that. And so all of our programming currently is online. By the end of 2021, our goal is to have a space here in Los Angeles and then in 2022 to have a space on the Navajo Nation. Um, so make sure to check us out and I'm gonna leave you with our Instagram and our website here, excuse me, our email address here. Um, if you take a look at our Instagram, we actually have something that is cool because I've gotten to braid together the Navajo Water Project and um, the Chapter House because we are doing an art exhibition together around water. And then of course, here is my personal artist website and my Instagram, so let me get back to the camera. Uh, thank you for, you know, giving us that wonderful sort of insight into how your artistic practice and your activism, they're really kind of entangled and they speak to each other. And, you know, I was really struck by, and I was thinking about this because Matt is here with us. Um, I was really struck by how your, the artwork that you've made uh, over the years is so um, grounded in documentary specificity and the material traces that at the same time, as you're telling us, are not widely available or not widely known. And, you know, Matt, this makes me wonder, I mean, as a historian, um, what's your perspective on like, uh, because because this, this what Emma is talking about, this is not like a hundred years old or this is recent history. So like, what's the story about why these things are not more widely known or more like, topics of urgent conversation. I mean, lack of access to running water or electricity, those are, you know, we, we tend to think about them as third world issues, but they're happening right here and they're current reality. So like, what's going on here? Well, you know, I just want to say, Emma, I was so um, just moved, but also enlightened that that you wanted to start with the treaties because I do think that's exactly where to start, and that's that that's where you start to understand the material conditions. But it's also where to start with Regato's question about why don't we know anything? Like the the not knowing is part of the imperial project. The 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 kind of the erasures and the willful ignorance and the willful forgetting and the kind of reinvention of American innocence like year after year after year is just like it's integral to the story. And so the work that you're doing, which I do think is it's historical work and it's documentary work as much as it is as it is artistic work um, is, is, is so important. I don't know what more to say about it than that, but I really thought that that you're taking us back to the treaties was exactly the place to, to start. Uh, to oh, no. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, with that said, I dropped um, a link here for everybody to take a look at because all of the treaties have actually been digitized by Oklahoma State University. So, um, you know, even the lost treaties, so they're all there. So definitely, you know, take a look at it. 
Um, to stay with the question of the treaties, because uh, you know you're grounding your work within that, and so you're kind of reanimating these histories that were uh, conveniently, you know, lost or overreaching. Um, I am I am thinking about this in the context of how indigenous art practices, indigenous art histories, um, have simply not been taught. Uh, you know, under the banner of American art, even though it is obviously the most American art of all. Um, uh, the Metropolitan Museum here just hired their first Native American uh, curator last year in the entire 150 years history of the museum. Um, there is a way in which, and I speak here as somebody trained in the discipline of art history, there is a way in which, uh, you know, African American or indigenous art histories have been held to be kind of separate um, from, so to speak, a broader history of American art. And I see here a kind of resonance to the 1980s in Britain, where a number of cultural critics like Stuart Hall, Paul Gilroy, Coven and Mercer, they were making the argument that, you know, the political coalition of British Blackness, which included Caribbean, African, South Asian peoples, um, the art and the work that they, the cultural production that they were making at the time, the argument was that this too is British art, that it is part of the British history and the histories of immigration are a part of that. Um, and Emma, I wonder, you know, this indigenous art that you're making and the entire history of indigenous art, um, how do they relate or how can we begin to uh, think about them as part of American history and American art history without also uh, I don't know, imposing these ideas of what, what constitutes American art. You know, I wonder what your thoughts are on this relation between American art and indigenous art. Yeah, that's a very important question. I'm actually gonna move rooms really quickly. We're having our sure. foundation work done and um, I'm very grateful to the people doing it, but it's very noisy, so <laughs> let me come into this room really quickly. And I also just moved, so um, please excuse the mess everywhere. So I think that is a very important question because the thing here is, you know, Native nations, I think are entirely different from the rest of the United States. Many of us have our own sovereign nations like the Navajo Reservation. And I think, um, you know, we have to sort of shift the way that we think about that because as a Navajo woman, I think of myself first and foremost as a citizen of the Navajo Nation. I think of myself after that as an American citizen. I hold a US passport, I vote in the United States, I pay taxes, so on and so forth. I don't think you can separate the two, but I do feel like we are a part of a different group of people. Um, and again, I think when we start to shift our mind to that, we really take into account the importance of sovereignty and how we do have to say there are hundreds of federally recognized tribes in the United States, and we are all so different from each other. So I think we it's important to move away from sort of the mentality of like, we're all natives, we're all indigenous, and then we're American, but rather we're Lakota, we are Inuit, we are um, Hopi, we are Navajo, and then Native American and then American. So I think it's also interesting to see like the categorization of art in museum spaces because it's always American Indian art and then American art. Um, and I think there's a way to definitely bridge that. Like, are we talking about physical locations? Are we talking about citizenship? Are we talking about cultures and ethnicities? And it's something that's complicated because again, like I'm an American, I've lived abroad. Um, and it was always interesting to have these conversations to explain to people, like I'm from the Navajo nation, I'm from a sovereign nation. 
which is within the United States. So when I you know, write a biography about myself or include caption information for art, I always specify that I'm Diné and that I'm Navajo and then that I'm American. Can I ask a related question um, that has to do with the plural publics and the people that you imagine yourself communicating to? Because that's it seems like a very complicated question in your work in certain ways. And, um, and I'm always just intrigued by, I mean, I think that the idea of a public is um, it's deceptively simple, but it turns out to always be very complicated. And I'm curious how you think about that, because there's a big difference between, you know, imagining a public who you're trying to reach with your work versus trying to evoke a new public through the meaning of your work. And I just wonder kind of how you think about those, those questions, especially as you work across some of the different kinds of spaces that you work in. That's a great question. And I think the perfect example here is when we talk about piccadillies right like i said that very jokingly like if you're from the reservation you know what a piccadilly is if you're not from the reservation you probably don't know what it is and it's something where it's like getting back to the idea of who gets to view art and who gets to experience it and who gets to go into a white cube space and who gets to go to a museum i mean my god museums are like 30 dollars to get into that's insane like who can afford that? And, you know, it's something that I've thought about a lot going to a school like the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where it's like a museum was so integral to my education, but I don't have many family members that could afford to go there. Um, and so oftentimes I do feel like there is sort of a split in my artwork where I feel like I'm making artwork for those who are from the res. And so having this sort of humorous element and I will get asked by people, well, I don't understand this work. I'm not from the reservation. And it doesn't matter to me. Like there can be plural audiences. Like if you're from the res and you get the humor in my work, then I feel like that's a huge win because there's just not enough of that work and that content out there for us as people from the reservation. I have a formal arts training, obviously, but you don't need a formal arts training to enjoy art. I think the other audience, again, like talking about the pieces about missing and murdered indigenous women and how you educate people differently. I wish there was a universal way to do it. I think the universality, universality of it is the visual element, but it just does need to be tailored and modified for different people. Um, but again, I think it is very idealistic to think yeah, oh my gosh, art uni unifies everybody. Like we should all just come together and this is art and you know, it's educational, but sometimes you do have to tailor it for different audiences. I want to kind of, uh, you know, piggyback off of Matt's question because I was thinking of, you know, the, your earlier response about how you kind of um, negotiate these ideas of sovereignty and then being American and all these sort of differing um, facets of identification. And um, Matt's right. I mean, what we're talking about here is not just some kind of monolithic American public, so much as different publics that together constitute the American sort of, uh, uh, and, and when, I, uh, when I'm saying American here, I literally mean people living within the territorial boundaries of this country, um, you know, the mass of people that that constitutes is itself constituted out of differing publics with differing kind of uh, affiliations, self-identifications, alliances. And, um, you know, to, on the one hand, maintain the kind of spe uh, specificity of the work that you're doing, um, to to narrate these specific histories of indigenous peoples, um, and also to kind of relate to, uh, I guess, you know, what passed for official um, history uh, as told by American governments. Uh, and I mean, in the end, if the goal is to kind of, as we say now, decolonize them, um, to make that 
in any way effective, it seems to me like you would have to uh, change the material conditions, you know, uh, beginning with how we narrate, how we tell these histories in universities, in museums. Um, and, um, and this is a question, therefore, to both of you, Emma, as an artist, as an activist, Matt, as a scholar, uh, as a, a historian, um, how do we begin to do that, like in a concrete way? Matt, I'd love to hear what you have to say about the educational element about it. Well, you know, I've been thinking about this. I don't know if this really gets at what Gwagato what was talking about, but I've been really thinking deeply, just as you were, as we were looking at your slides, I was thinking about the very complicated, um, and again, this is like the thick traces of, of colonialism and the, the really, um, you know, the brutalities of the history in this country, but but there's a very complicated kind of speaking for and speaking to in the kind of work that you do. And there's, you know, there's a, a kind of, um, and, it's, and, it, and it's not just um, native artists like yourself, it's, it's true of African-American writers and artists, it's true of, um, you, know, you know, pretty much any, any um, population who's been, um, who's, who's been on, on the brutal end of American empire. But there's, there's a kind of responsibility to speak for your people, um, but also to speak to them, but also to speak to the, the um, people on the outside of that group, but to speak, to speak to them for your people. Like it's a very complicated set of, of moves. And I was thinking about that, especially in terms of the, the white cube space and the hair, that some viewers might look at that and feel accused um, and some viewers might look at that and feel enlisted. And I just wondered kind of how you think about the intentionality of your work as, a, as this very complicated mode of expression in, um, in a space that already has kind of racialized power relations written into it. I don't know if that gets at the thing that Sfugato is asking or not. I but, think it does. But that's kind of been what's been on my mind. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it, when it comes to like changing the way that people think or changing the way that people are educated or changing the way that people experience art, I don't think there's a simple formula. What I think it comes down to in terms of simplicity is teaching people the basics, right? Like again, treaty, there's nothing more basic when it comes to Native Americans except treaties. There are so many differences that we have um, that like you said, Matt, I mean, there are people who will reach out to me in Los Angeles and they'll say, well, can you help us with a land acknowledgement? Or we have questions about, you know, indigeneity. And I'm like, how the heck do I know? I'm not Tongva. I'm not like, I'm not going to help you with land acknowledgement. I'm from a reservation that's nine hours away from here. I can't speak for Tongva people just because we happen to be um, native nations. I mean, I understand that they're on the right path, but it's like, whoa, like step back. That would be like saying, um, hey, someone from South Africa, can you explain something to me that's going on in Egypt? And it's like, okay, you know, they're from the African continent and there are many things that tie them together, but they're completely different cultures. Mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes you do kind of have to be accusatory when it comes to things, because if you're turning your back or you're turning a blind eye, you're just a part of the problem. And if you don't know the treaties or you don't know whose land you're occupying, the basic simple solution is just find out. You know, we all have this magical thing, called, not all of us, but many of us have this magical thing called the internet and we have smartphones. And I think it's one of the best tools out there that sometimes, you know, I do feel a little annoyed and a little angry when people ask me questions and I'm thinking like, you could just look this up on the most basic website, you know, like Wikipedia exists or, you know, like I, I think anyone who's ever heard me talk has heard me say this, like I learned the saying from someone who used to do our social media um, for the Navajo Water Project, don't be frugal with your Google, literally use this amazing tool that you have because libraries used to be really hard to get to, but if you start using the internet, 
if you can spend hours on Twitter, if you can spend hours on Instagram, you can spend the five minutes to Google something. Um, and that includes with visual images, right? Like Google image search, what is, what is better? Um, but I, I really do think it's, it's interesting, Matt, about the speaking for your people, because it's like, is that our responsibility? And do we actually, as different peoples, no matter who you are, of whatever background, um, whether you're a person of color or not, like, is that something that we have to do? I think, unfortunately, sometimes we do need to do that because I am very privileged in the way that I'm talking to you from Zoom right now. Um, I do have internet connectivity. I have a cell phone. I'm a very vocal, honestly, sometimes big mouthed person, but not everybody who grew up in the same area that I did is or has those supplies like the internet or basic human rights in 2021. And so sometimes you have to use your platform and speak up for folks. And again, like we see with social media, what is it being used for? You know, I love a good dog video and I love like all these sorts of like cute animals, but sometimes if you have a platform, stand up and use it and educate people about things like missing and murdered indigenous women or racist masketry, or do you want Deb Holland to be confirmed? Whatever it is, it's like, we do kind of have to stand up and say something. Unfortunately, when it really shouldn't be our responsibility, we do. I think we'll, uh, you know, take questions from the audience. We've got two. Um, Ryan's asking, uh, well, he's saying great work on the Deep Deep Water Project on the Navajo Nation. Uh, I have a question. Has your organization worked around the problem of filtering out high uranium and arsenic concentrations from unregulated well water research from past uranium mining activities? Thank you for those kind words. And that's a really great question. Um, no, it's not something that we've done. What we'll do is identify different water sources, which are either managed by the Navajo Tribal Utility Authority, um, or which is an enterprise on the Navajo Nation, or the Navajo Nation Water Resource Department, which generally doesn't work with potable or water that's fit for drinking. Um, and you know, if there's a well that's in use, then we'll go from that and make sure that we're doing our due diligence of testing that water or reviewing the tests that are conducted frequently. Um, if it's something that hasn't been a potable source, we will test for things like arsenic or uranium. And if it's there and there's not a way um, for more simple remediation or for um, rehabilitation of the wells, generally we'll step away and look for something else. You know, we wanna make sure that we are experts at what we're doing. And I mean, honestly, we're not experts at um, remediation or the cleanup of these different wells that might have um, higher concentrations of those two things. So it's something where I know, I always give him a shout out, but Dr. Tommy Rock, um, who's a scientist on the Navajo Nation is doing a ton of great work when it comes to that. And so I encourage everyone to look up his work um, because it's like a huge issue, right? It's not something that you can just say, all right, well, there's uranium in there, so we're not gonna do it. It's more like who is an expert and who can come and like figure that out and make sure that it's happening and more importantly, make sure it's sustainable and there's a plan of operation and maintenance. Isabella is saying, Emma, congratulations on your title change to executive director of the Navajo Water Project. I'm wondering if you could explain or define the use of ally versus slash and accomplice. How do you distinguish, but, uh, how do you dis uh, distinguish between or define the two? Yeah, thank you, Isabella. I actually just want to share with everyone I got. Um, I am or have until this morning been the director of the Navajo Water Project and I'm the executive director. So thank you for that. Um, you know, the way that I see it is I feel like accomplice takes it one step further than being an ally. It's actually saying like, hey, I am in it with you and I am going to make it happen. I mean, think about like what an accomplice in crime is, you know, like it's somebody who's actually stepping in and it's not a crime to indigenize or decolonize or start community art spaces or have water projects. But, you know, I think allyship and accompliceship is something that I 
recently learned the difference of in the past year when I started this work. And I realized that, you know, we've seen with the Black Lives Matter movement and with changing racist mascots and now um, stepping up with our Asian American brothers and sisters and saying like, we need to stand by you to make change happen. It's about giving people space and allowing them to use their voices and speak on their own behalf and not victimize ourselves. You know, it's important and it's important to still have that side where we're saying, hey, I am standing next to you and I'm gonna help with this. You know, I don't know if it means that you're doing it financially, if you're spreading word through social media or if you're actually gonna go out and march or put your body on the front line, but that's where I see the difference. Well, I just, I just, you know, thank you for that question, and thank you for your comment, Emma. Um, I'm not speaking for the white population, but I, I will speak to them. That I really think that being an ally is just a useless thing. Like it's just proven itself to be a useless thing. And I, I love the idea of accomplish, of, of accomplice, um, that status, uh, and that that commitment, the commitment that's implied in the word accomplice. Um, because ally in the in the era of of BLM on the on the on the one hand it seems and and Standing Rock too for that matter, um, it's significant that some white people have come out of the woodwork to really participate in these in these movements and protests, but they've also kind of vacated the most meaningful aspects of what allyship could mean, and, and I think that maybe the word accomplice kind of re recaptures what it ought to mean. So I'm really appreciative of that comment. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's, it's again, it's something that when we work around the language with the chapter house or even with the Navajo Water Project, you know, I don't do a lot on the marketing side of the Navajo Water Project. I'm like strictly programming and sometimes fundraising. And it's important that when we have these projects, we're using the correct language as well or more updated language because I totally agree. There's a difference between posting a black square for Black Lives Matter and making it about yourself Whereas standing up and saying, all right, I'm gonna take it a step further and I'm gonna educate myself and I'm gonna read up a lot more on it. And I'm gonna share this information um, with my family and my community because I mean, all of us here know the importance of education and understand that it's not just for the elite. We should all be able to spread this and make sure that we know these things when it comes to communication. Um, we have a comment from Ryan who's saying he would like to connect with you about solving this problem about the, the water purification thing. Um, I'll put you two in contact later on. Ryan, thank you for stepping up. This is, um, this is being an accomplice, I think, based on what we just talked about. Yeah. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming together here. Um, we're going to have the next event in the series on March 23rd with T.J. Lee, who is a, who took her PhD from Yale in African-American and I believe art history. Uh, T.J. is the director of academic affairs and the associate curator of special projects at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Um, we will be circulating details about that. And I hope to see many of you here that day match. Thank you again so much for being here today. Emma, thank you for being a part of this. Um, everybody else, stay safe, enjoy the weekend, and I hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. This was really, really great. Thank you. Yeah, it was such a pleasure. Thank you all. Thanks, Fugato. Thank you. Thanks, Fugato. Have a good weekend, y'all. <laughs>